In the alliterative Mort Arthur, one of the memorable sequences is towards the beginning of the romance, in which the uh, ambassadors from Rome are treated to a sumptuous meal uh, given to them by King Arthur as their chivalric host. It's quite a remarkable passage, and at this time of year when we think of feasting and coming together, albeit in difficult times for us all, the passage has great celebratory meaning for us and uh, I want to share this passage with you now. Now they are housed as behoves, beheld highly as guests, with haste and homage within these high walls. In chambers with chimneys they change their clothes until the Chancellor fetches them with chivalrous knights. Soon the Senator was sat, as befitting his status, with the king at his table, two knights courtly served him with as singular reverence as Arthur himself, richly on his right hand at the round table. For the Romans were reasoned as richly regarded, and of the most royal blood that reigned on earth. Then in comes the first course, and placed before the king, boar heads that were brightly burnished with silver, served by trained and taught men all richly attired. Servants of royal blood, some sixty at once, fattened flesh of the season with noble frumenti, and all the game you would want for, and wonderful birds, peacocks and plovers on platters of gold, piglets of porcupine that had never seen pasture, then Herons by their plumage hidden full fair, Great swans full displayed on silver chargers, Tarts made from turkey to taste when they liked, Gumbolds most gorgeous, gracious to the taste, Broad shoulders of boar, the best flesh true sliced, Barnacle geese and bittern battered in dishes, And young hobbies in bread nothing tasted better with breast of barrow the brightest to be seen. Then come several stews, most joyously after, in an azure sauce that seemed all aflame, and from the jelly of which flares leapt high aloft to delight every lord that would look upon them. Then cranes and curlews roasted with craft, Conies in spiced cream, coloured most fair, and pheasants enfolded in flaming silver, adorned with many dainties and daubed with egg. Then claret and Cretan wine cleverly run through most curious conduits, all of clear silver. Alsace and Algarve wine, and many others, Rochelle and Rhenish wine, none was ever richer. Vernage from Venice, with the virtues of Crete, from taps of fine gold that flowed on demand. The cupboard of the king enclosed all his silver with great gold gilt goblets of glorious hues, and there was a chief butler, a most noble chevalier, Sir Kay the Courteous, who served from one cup a set of sixty cups more made for the king's company, skilfully crafted and curved with great beauty each one partly picked out with precious stones, that no poison should slip secretly past them, lest the bright gold beneath should burst it all asunder, and the venom be void by virtue of those stones. The conqueror himself was likewise cleanly arrayed, clad in colours of clear gold, with his company of knights dressed with his diadem on his great dais, for he was deemed the doughtiest that dwelt upon earth. Then the conqueror kindly spoke to those lords, and cheered the Romans with right royal speech. Sirs, be knightly of countenance, and comfort yourselves. We know naught in this country of curious meats. In these barren lands breeds no such thing. So, without feigning pleasure, please force this food down, and feed yourselves with such feeble fare as you find before you. Sir, says the senator, so help me Christ, such royalty never reigned within the walls of Rome. There is no prelate, nor pope, nor prince on this earth that would not be well pleased with this 
precious food. As was due by their rank, they wash and walk to the room. This well-acclaimed conqueror with countless of his knights, Sir Gawain the Worthy, leads Guinevere on one side. On the other was Sir Uhtred, the Lord of Turin. Then afterwards they spent spices unsparingly. Then Malmsey and Muscatel, these marvellous drinks, were served round most quickly in russet gold cups. To all those rich ones in turn, the Romans as well. Then that sovereign in truth, as pleased himself, assigned to the senator certain great lords to lead him to his lodgings when he asked for his leave with mirth and sweet melody of noble minstrels then the conqueror afterwards goes to take counsel with lords whose allegiance is owed to himself and joyfully he wends to the giant's tower with justices judges and gentle knights it's a stunning passage isn't it the way Arthur, with ironic self-deprecation at the end, says to the Roman ambassadors, we have but feeble fare here, nothing that uh, is worthy of the likes of you, and of course it's more splendid than anything ever imaginable. The nature of the banquet is this. It, it's meant to state Arthur's power uh, compared to the Romans, but also the audience for this poem, we might imagine them not as royalty, not as high lords of the realm. Instead, they might be uh, upper gentry. What these portrayals of food um, are about is almost like an imagined uber rich service. The writer, the poet, is trying to make each core sound bigger better, brighter, more fantastic than the last, the flares rising from the azure cream of the sauce, for example. This is how people like to portray the mystical majesty of King Arthur in uh, gentrified households of the late 14th century. If you enjoyed that passage, and I hope you did, um, it comes from uh, my forthcoming uh, translation of the alliterative Mort Arthur. King Arthur's Death, which is publishing in February 2021. It's available now on pre-order through all good bookshops and through all online outlets. Those who, who, who pledged for the book and supported it uh, through its crowdfunding campaign will already have received their copies and uh, they're all named in the back. And a big thank you to them for allowing the book to be published it's both through their generosity and support that that's happened, so thank you to them. And I'm currently crowdfunding for a third book in my series of alliterative romances. So there's King Arthur's Death, there's also Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, which published in 2018. And now I'm working on a translation of the 14th century alliterative romance, William of Palerne, or, as Madden called it in the 19th century, the romance of William and the Werewolf. And this is a very special romance indeed. It has love, it has betrayal, it has a werewolf, it has magic. It's got lots of wonderful elements that make the true medieval romance come alive. This is a romance that you might call typical, but it's glorious. It really, it's got it's a sumptuous alliterative story uh, which deals with the exquisite pain of love and eventual triumph over adversity. So if you'd like to support that, please do. But in the meantime, the alliterative Mort Arthur publishes in February 2021. Please pre-order your copy now. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you.